Hello, my name is James Arroyo, and welcome to Chapter 5, Audience Analysis. Communication is co-created, meaning that the sender sends a message, but also the audience interprets that message. So, if we do not truly understand our audience and adapt to our audience, then we only have 50% of control over our own message. So, we want to be able to adapt to our audience to be able to better affect our audience. So, let's jump right in with some useful information about audiences that we could potentially use to adapt to our audience. Age is a big one. Some references may not simply land uh, because of age differences. Uh, does anyone remember uh, Watergate? or 9-11, or the San Bernardino uh, shooting a few years ago, all of which are different um, moments of time, and obviously different people in different ages would have a different perspective on every one of those. We also have gender. Uh, with gender, the general... The ge uh, the general idea is that we want to be sure that we are being inclusive and recognizing and appreciating differences, that we are trying to avoid gendered language, like, um, you know, male man, um, business man, instead focusing on the gender uh, inclusive word of person. Uh, also, religion. Uh, even if you're group seems to be of one specific religion, don't assume that you know your religion of your audience. Because uh, even if it is a group of, let's say, uh, Christians, then there are multiple sects within the Christian community. So, of course, every person within that would have different beliefs about what is um, religious and what is not religious. So, if you do have to talk about religion, use it to highlight the uniqueness of your own beliefs to then highlight the uniqueness of others. Also, we have sexual orientation. Uh, avoid trigger words. Same thing with racial, ethnic, and cultural background. So, in general, always strive to be inclusive. Now we jump to group membership. Uh, group membership involves co-cultures. Co-cultures are cultures within a larger culture that have distinct values, beliefs, and behaviors. For example, we are all within the American culture, but there are two distinct cultures within that of Democrat, Republican. Even further within uh, Democrat, per se, you'd have moderate and progressive co-cultures within a larger culture. So, by understanding the values, beliefs, and behaviors of the co-cultures in, uh, in which your audience uh, lands, that will help you better adapt to specific uh, examples that will tailor more to their uh, experience. We also have socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status can play a part, uh, but what qualifies as rich in California versus Nevada versus New York City. Socioeconomic status is not necessarily a specific number. It is uh, how it, uh, how, how things um, relate to other people within that uh, area. And homogeneity is the sameness within an audience. By understanding whether or not our audience is homogeneous, uh, meaning the same, then you may not have to adapt to different, uh, to many different types of people. Uh, for example, if the audience is entirely men, entirely um, um, uh, baseball players, entirely Republican, entirely um, 40. At that point, then you may not need to adapt to many different people, but no audience is going to be entirely homogeneous. So we always have to be inclusive of all groups. So there's other useful information of the audience. First, 
the previous knowledge of this topic. If the audience knows a great deal about the topic beforehand, then you may be able to skip some of the, uh, uh, the, the foundational understandings of your topic and go into more deeper level. It's kind of like starting a math class with one plus one equals two at the college level. That's not going to engage the audience as much as starting where they may already know. And um, whereas the opposite can also be true. Try having a discussion in algebra to a bunch of uh, second to third grade uh, third graders. That's going to change. Uh, so in general, their previous knowledge is going to affect what you are able to talk about. We also have ego involvement. This is how much the audience cares, as well as what their initial perspective on this topic is. We're going to jump into this far more in the persuasive sections, but in general, if I care a great deal, then my latitude of acceptance or rejection is high. And my attitude or anchor point is going to determine whether or not I accept or reject. So for example, if I strongly reject the idea that pineapple belongs on pizza, then I'm going to have a high latitude of rejection. Whereas if I don't care that much, I would have a low latitude of rejection. If I ha cared a great deal about it and I agreed with the initial assertion, then I'd have a high latitude of acceptance. If I didn't care all that much, I'd have a low latitude of acceptance. Meaning that the majority of what I hear, I am going to agree with, or very little of what I hear, I'm going to agree with going to be discussed more in detail in persuasive chapters, but we're going to move on. Another environment, another factor is environment. Environment can get you great insights on your audience. A, a very good one is size. The larger the audience, the more formal your presentation has to be. Because by very virtue that there are a lot of people there, means that it is a more important topic. It's a more important discussion. So you should act formally because they all came to see you. So you have to act formally. Also, look at how the audience is dressed. You should always dress slightly better than your audience. Speaking of formality. Also, the seating arrangement and location with the speaker. There are formal means by which we present where the all of the audience is looking at you. But there are other ways that you could have a seating arrangement. The seating arrangement could be completely around you, and then you'd have to adapt your de delivery to that situation. Also, Zoom is going to affect your delivery because instead of eye contact where I can look at a few people throughout the audience, instead, I look directly at the camera, or I try to anyway. Also, will microphones be available? That's an important part because that determines whether or not you will need to project as much as you would if you didn't have a microphone. Also, keep in mind recent events. For example, if you were talking about infectious diseases, you probably would have to use uh, uh, COVID-19 as an example of an, of an infectious disease. We also have to keep in mind the audience's expectations uh, throughout the speech. First, we have to understand why the audience is there. If they are captive, that means that they attendance is mandatory and that they are forced to be there. Whereas volunteer audiences show that uh, attendance is optional and they chose to be here. That's going to fundamentally shape how you present your speech. Because if the audience is captive, you may have to try to engage them more. They may not have as much prior experience or knowledge on the topic. And overall, uh, you will need to work harder to communicate your ideas clearly and effectively because they may not care 
as much about your topic. You may have to provide relevance for them. Whereas for a volunteer audience, they chose to be there, meaning they it's already relevant to them. They may already have a greater understanding of the topic, and you may not need to work as hard in engaging them, instead focusing on the information and communicating that as clearly as possible. So why they are there is a big part of the audience's expectations. Another audience expectation involves quant content and quality. The quality of the speech involves the level of preparation and delivery skills. For a classroom, the quality at the beginning of the class may be very low, rightfully so, because we are here to learn about public speaking, but we have not learned public speaking yet. So, quality may be uh, quality expectations may be low whereas once we develop and once we grow at the very end of the speech class the quality uh, expectations will be a lot higher also what are the quality expectations of a ted talk of a presidential address of a um, of a guest speaker so there are different expectations of quality. We also have content expectations, and this is a big one. Length expectations are a big part, because if I was to keep the class 20, 30, 50 minutes late every single day, then that's obviously going to not endear me to that audience. Versus, if I cut it too short every single day, then that also would shake the audience's expectation. But the bigger one is specific content. Some audiences will look for specific content. For example, if you are talking about um, types of renewable energy sources and you do not discuss solar, or, a, or another big one, then of course the audience is going to be a little bit shocked that that wasn't discussed. And you would have to show why that expectation is not addressed. Another one uh, is uh, tech, um, tech presentations. That what is the content expectation at the very end of the speech? A lot of times, it is the big reveal. And if there is no big reveal, then that can actually shock the audience and as a result make them have a more negative uh, perception of the speech as a whole. So there are many expectations that need to be addressed. So now let's talk about how to get this information. There's many ways. First, observation. Looking at the audience can help. Um, if you see that your audience is entirely one gender or entirely one age or entirely uh, one um, uh, whatever, it really doesn't matter. You can observe that. We also involve research and that by researching your information, you'll be able to be more able to adapt to them. This means if you are going to a specific organization to talk to them, looking at their website might be a good way of going about it. If you feel, if you are addressing a largely conservative or liberal um, audience, you may want to read and watch some of the media that they consume so that you are better able to address how they uh, perceive certain events and what are some of the um, what are the some of the symbolic meanings that they have already created through those. Another good example, another good way to collect information is to interview. Interviewing someone familiar with or representative of the audience. This could help you get some further insights on who you are speaking to. And you could even throw out surveys. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Mark A or B. A for I feel strongly, I feel good about it, or I feel bad about it. There are some major benefits to this in that you can send inform you can get uh, information from a lot of people, but there are a lot of great detriments as well that 
you may not get the best information or the uh, most nuanced picture of your audience. So how do we adapt to our audience? First, with the demographic attributes, we should never try to stereotype or pander towards a specific audience. For example, it would be um, over accommodating and pandering and stereotyping, frankly, if I knew that my uh, audience was very, very old, then I would just speak louder. That would be a bit too much. Also, uh, you want to be sure that you're using proper language. And um, another good example of the stereotyping and pandering, and that actually happens a lot of times with politicians, is that if they go to, let's say, the South, to start campaigning, they uh, what some politicians have done, which is bad, is that they start to speak with more with more of a southern drawl than uh, if they were speaking to a um, a place that doesn't have that southern drawl. So with this information, what we should do is we should develop good supporting materials, like examples, like statistics, like testimonial, that the demographic show will be rel uh, that it will be relevant to their demographics. That is the way to ad adapt to audience demographics. Also, we have adapting based on the audience's relationship to the topic. This influences our topic selection because we want something that we care about. We also want something that they care about. So we want to balance out those two so that we are able to choose a topic that both of us care about so that we're able to talk about it effectively. It also alters the focus of the specific purpose as well as the complexity of the topic. If the audience skews younger in age, then of course, it may not need it may not be able to be so complex there are some other ways that we adapt to our audience with the speaking environment you may have to adapt to the logistics there are a lot of logistics in zoom for example that when you are sharing a video through zoom you actually have to do a setting to make it so that you can actually hear the audio also look the part you should dress slightly better than your audience. Also, arrive early. This me. Uh, when does your speech end? Uh, sorry, when does your speech start? It doesn't start right when you start speaking. Instead, it arrives well before your speech because you are already making impressions on your audience. And if you are arriving early, that communicates something very good. If you are arriving barely on time, that doesn't communicate something very good. So. If, it, if, it, if you arrive late, that's even worse. And also choose the right style for the audience. Younger audiences, you may want to be more engaging and lively, have more videos, have more ways to capture the audience's attention. Whereas for older audiences, that may seem to be a bit too much and something that will um, make the audience feel like it's not serious. And we also want to meet the audience's expectations. We do this by meeting them or addressing why they are not being met. A good example of this would be if you are talking about um, vacation trips uh, or vacation spots in Mexico, but you don't discuss any beaches, then you would say, I'm not going to be discussing beaches because beaches in general tend to be the same everywhere you go. And I'm focusing exclusively to the uh, experiences you will be able to find in Mexico. Also, take questions to make sure expectations are met, if, if you have any curiosity about that. And uh, in general, this will allow you to customize your audience, to, uh, your speech to your audience. There are major great, uh, there are major benefits to audience analysis and adaptation. First, it maintains high levels of interest because the information is relevant to your audience. Do you care a lot about football? Maybe not. So if I was to talk about football, it wouldn't be relevant to you, and therefore you may not have as much interest in that topic. It also helps achieve your, achieve your speech goal of informing or persuading or entertaining. Uh, 
We also meet the audience's expectations of the speech so that they aren't confused as to why things were not discussed. Also helps handle adversarial audiences because if you adapt to an adversarial audience, it shows you understand them. It shows and therefore you are already adapting to what they are thinking and ways that they are arguing against you. And it also helps avoid embar embarrassing remarks. And that concludes audience analysis and adaptation. Have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you next time. Bye.